welcome to the Beacon Salon Lecture Series. The Salon Lecture Series is an educational outreach program of Beacon College in Leesburg, Florida. Beacon is a nonprofit liberal arts school and America's first accredited baccalaureate institution dedicated to educating students who learn differently. In its third season, the Beacon Salon Lecture Series presents periodic lectures from September to April that feature Beacon College faculty addressing compelling subjects in their respective liberal arts fields. This installment focuses on something in which my wife just hates that I hold a black belt in. Sarcasm. But it's not just me. Sarcasm permeates American culture. It can be the seed of good humor, a show of personal power, or a killer of relationships. In her lecture, Sarcasm as a Second Language, really? Dr. Nikki Nance addresses the many dimensions of sarcasm, including how sarcasm affects the brain, how sarcasm interferes with more productive communications, and how well executed sarcasm can engage and influence others. Dr. Nikki Nance is a psychotherapist and an associate professor of human services and psychology at Beacon College. She is a 2013 contributor to Techniques and Interventions for Substance Use Disorders, published by the Virginia Association of Counselor Education and Supervision. And she's also a contributing editor to the Encyclopedia of Counseling Theories and the 2014 edition of the Encyclopedia of Human Services and Diversity. She has been quoted in numerous outlets, including Reader's Digest, FastCompany.com, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Chicago Tribune, the Palm Beach Post, U.S. News and World Report, Forbes, Self, Red Book, and Reuters Health MD Alert. And she has appeared as a featured expert on Voice of America's American Cafe, the Sean Green Show, the Joy Carden Show on Wisconsin Public Radio, and on the Second Thought with Celeste Headley on Georgia Public Broadcasting. And now, we present Dr. Nikki Nance. Thanks, Daryl. Um, I was really happy to take on um, the topic of sarcasm, and nobody was surprised that I took on the topic of sarcasm. So I hope you can have a little bit of fun with it. Um, and, but I think there's another serious thing that goes on with our very sarcastic society. I think we've lost a lot of our whole uh, you know, real and authentic communication because of it. Um, so I really do believe it's become our second language. Um, Oscar Wilde said, sarcasm is the lowest form of wit, but the highest form of intelligence. Um, I remember when I was little, my dad was very sarcastic. He was wonderful. And he said to me, I, I, I said, one of my teachers said I was really witty. And he said to me, yeah, she was half right. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> I've kind of lived with, uh, and I think there are families that have that wonderful culture of sarcasm and the good relationships to support it. So I'm not saying that it's not the way to go, because certainly it's the way I go. Um, I want to answer some questions today, though. What is sarcasm? Um, what's the impact of it? How can it be beneficial? And how do you disarm sarcastic people? So I hope that some of that appeals to some of you. The word sarcasm comes from the Greek word sarcasian, which means to peel off the skin. Um, the most common definition is, uh, includes irony, that you're saying something and the meaning is the opposite. Um, but we've really generalized this to any snarky thing, whether there's an oppositional force in it or not, we're calling sarcasm. Um, the underpinning is it conveys contempt, hostility, and, um, and condescension a lot of times, way too much. Um, it's generalized, really, to include anything that's clever, but the underpinning there is clever and mean. So uh, just ill-intended quips of all kinds. Um, I'll show you in a little bit, you know, like how this overlaps with all the other ways that we communicate, which would, could be, you know, humor all the way up to verbal abuse. Um, it kind of reminded me when I was digging through this of the way um, 
the definition of literally now includes figuratively. <laughs> we've, we've gone to, uh, uh, you know, you got to love the English language. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so in, in this illustration, I really want to uh, kind of give you an idea of a, a continuum of uh, of communication. So I have humor um, at one end and sarcasm right next to it. Not all he, sarcasm is really humorous. A lot of humor is sarcastic. Of course, humor has a good basis in irony. That's what makes us laugh. It's a surprise. Everybody loves a surprise. Um, so sarcasm, I kind of split between humor and um, and its own pure form, sarcasm. But the other ways that, and people call this sarcastic, that are really not, they're far beyond sarcastic, would be mocking, um, straightforward insults, and then verbal abuse. So my life work is as a mental health counselor, and I really have seen so many people that were victims of constant verbal abuse, either from their um, uh, family of origin or from a partner, um, and it really changes a person. And a lot of that is couched in, oh, I was just kidding. In other words, they're saying I was being sarcastic. Um, it, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it, or I will, because I'm the only one talking. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more um, about uh, what this does in relationships and what, in what relationships, you know, what kind of sarcasm is appropriate in what kinds of relationships. Um, the intent of sarcasm is the same for every definition I found. It's to hurt or embarrass the recipient. Being the target of constant sarcasm is damaging. It's the seed of shame. Um, and if it's misunderstood, then it's even more damaging. Um, in the, lately in our field, they've been talking about, it was like kind of uh, uh, a different kind of trauma, which is from this ongoing um, like battering of somebody's ego through life. And that people later, even though they're successful in life, a lot of times you're gonna come up with depression or anxiety that's related to this constant kind of trauma. Um, so we're learning more and more about the damage. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're learning. Um, here's how it happens. You'll see that I have the send. I'm, I'm going to just show you a communication. We have a sender. <laughs> That's the person that wants to communicate something. Um, and they have an intent. There's something they want to get across to you. And they have to encode that in their mind some way, so, you know, how they're going to say this to you. Of course, this all happens in a split second. Um, and then there's a mode of communication. So the mode of communication, face-to-face, -face, um, uh, um, texting, calling, so just verbal, no visual, um, showing the person, not saying anything, but demonstrating it with a facial expression. Um, I'm told I can't hide much. And I think the main expression that people say they see me do is, so it's a very little of a, it's not extreme, but it's easy to pick up for people that, um, if it's being directed at you, I guess. So I've heard. Um, so you have your message that the person is sending. And here it comes bopping across the, the, the uh, screen for you. It says, sarcastic message. And I wanted to talk about that. Now, on the other end of the communication, the person getting it, they're catching it, they have to encode it. Like, what do you mean by that, huh? <laughs> um, and they encode it, and then real quickly, they're going to have a reaction and a response, and sometimes a reply. Now, if you're in face-to-face -face conversation, you have a lot more information to go with. If I'm smiling and I make a sarcastic comment to you, I can, my encoding is going to uh, probably be more favorable, as I, I see you smiling. If I get this in a text message or in an email, and I can't see your intent, then I'm, I'm going to have a reaction that, wasn't, that doesn't maybe match your intent. And now I've got an intent of my own. Um, and this is how things kind of go down the toilet in relationships. It just made me think about a, a couple that I saw um, many years ago, decades ago, and they said each other's names with venom, like Mary, <laughs> Rodney. They just could barely get each other's names out. They seem, to, they, they seem to want to work it out. I couldn't imagine why. Um, although I think it was Winston Churchill that said unhappy couples should stay together because 
why make four people miserable? So I kind of uh, wanted to work with this couple, maybe not for that particular reason. But she would say something to him, and then he would just kind of snarl. And he said he didn't want to come home at night because there was always this argument. And I said, you know, I dug into it a little bit. And I said to him, I said to her, do you miss him when he's still at work? And she said, yeah. And he said, well, you never said that. And I said, well, tell him. She said, well, I do miss you. And I, you know, that's why I'm like agitated by the time you get home. So we had a few more um, little exchanges like that. And eventually he said, I see what we need to do is you just need to come home and interpret for us as though we speak two different languages because we're not getting this across at all. So they learned. They learned. And there's a, at that time there was a, a book out and it came with flashcards and it was called Talk to Me Like I'm Someone You Love. I tried to uh, dredge it up to, um, to put it on our references tonight. But if you, if, you, if you need it, I'll find it for you. So just shoot me an email. Um, so the brain is doing something in the, in the heads of Mary and Rodney while this is, while this is going on. Um, it, one of the things that's happening, they call it now like the polyvagal brain or the polyvagal brain, that we're learning that the, the brain um, experiences emotional trauma, even a little bit of emotional trauma, the same way that it experiences physical trauma. Or, you know, or, or stark critical trauma, which means that you go into a fight or flight response. So the fight or flight response, you know, you're, it's, something happens in a split second, your body's working, um, your, uh, your pupils start to dilate, um, just because if we were in, if we were cave people, we would need to see, see what was the threat around us. But your pupils dilate, your hearing becomes much more acute. You can hear dogs barking three blocks away. Um, the blood is going from your, uh, your heart's racing, your breathing becomes shallow because we're trying to get the blood out to the arms and legs for fight and flight. I, I'm going to challenge you to think about your current life and what kind of stressors you have where fight or flight would be of any help whatsoever. You know, so our bodies have taken a long time. They're not, they haven't caught up with our evolution. I haven't caught up with civilization and certainly not with American culture. So when this happens, because your blood's out here for fight or flight, um, it goes away from your brain and your stomach. It goes away from your brain and your stomach. Uh, so you get butterflies in your stomach. And, you know, you have a random uh, exchange with somebody that may be heated or maybe not, or maybe you just shut down completely and do have flight. Um, 20 minutes after it's over, you think of everything you wish you would have said. So why? Because when this, the blood is all fresh and new coming back into your brain and you're like, I'm clever. You know, there's all kinds of stuff you could have said. So if you think about how, how strong that is in, in the brain, you know, so fast in a split second. And if there's something traumatic, the brain also, we know now, can separate some things out. In a regular trauma, we talk about flashbulb memories that you remember, you know, you're going to remember something in slow motion later, even though it was only a split second. Um, people get those kinds of flashbulb memories about unkind things said to them. And those actually go directly into long-term memory. You don't have that 40 second while the short term memory decides and filters and uh, so it goes right into long term memory. So that's why they stick with us for so long. And think about negative things said to you, especially as a child, the, you know, your dad says it to you once or your mom says it or your brother says it to you once, uh, yeah, you really don't belong in this family and you're three years old, you don't know how to interpret that, but you, you hear it over and over and over. They said it once and then you played it the rest of the times. Okay. So these things uh, get dug in. They come with a sting. They're, you know, they go, they're kind of wired in now. Um, and you become more vulnerable to any other kind of criticism that's in that, that's in that uh, area. Now, sarcastic people don't, may not even know you. They don't know necessarily how that's having an effect on you. It's, it's probably not included in their intent. But if you're sensitive to it, you know, it's just like a person with a cat. If you're allergic to it, it's a little different than if you're not. Um, nobody's intending for you to have this uh, terrible reaction. So um, messages actually will become beliefs. Somebody tells you long enough, you're never going to make anything of yourself. You cease to try to make something of yourself. Um, 
and people play them indefinitely. I know people that have worked on doing good you know, affirmations, and somebody will hit them with that sarcastic comment, and it all goes away, and they just keep hearing that same thing over and over. I'll never make it. I'll never make it. Um, beliefs also get projected onto others. If I'm, if I'm worthless, then you must be worthless too. You know, if, I, if I don't have any sense, then why would you have any sense? So what we have are people that are negative. I call them negaholics. And then there are a lot of them, really bright ones especially, and so successful ones, are really good at sarcasm. They have such a negative inner dialogue, they're good at spitting it out um, and doing kind of damage around whoever, whoever else is there. Um, really, is in therapy, a lot of the work that was done um, was trying to help people to replace that, uh, that negative narrative um, and the negativity that was on everything around them to a more strength-based narrative, particularly about themselves. So it, with our brain, um, when I talk to somebody and I'm trying to help them to replace those, we actually have a little technique that's called brain savoring. We talk to the person, you know, you try to talk to them a, a minute about that positive thing. So it will go in long-term memory. So it'll have a fighting chance against that dug-in, wired-in negative thing that they heard in somebody's sarcastic remarks. Um, what you see here is a, um, a little illustration. I, I tried. I really wanted to illustrate, like how, how does sarcasm permeate our whole culture? How do we have on the internet and on, you know, like Karens? How do we have Karens? You know, these mean, nasty, <laughs> insulting people. How does that become part of our cult culture so much that we've given them like a herdship of their own? Um, so what you'll see in the corner, I've started uh, down at the bottom. It starts with your inner dialogue and your own negative narrative. And in the green circle above uh, the next layer is maybe your intimate relationship. So uh, people not knowing how to talk to each other, you know, if they get their feelings hurt, then they snipe back in a sarcastic way. Or they've come from a family that's very good at this, and they uh, end up in a relationship with somebody that doesn't understand it or is very sensitive to it, does not have that kind of a, of a culture in their family. So those kinds of discrepancies occurs right, occur right in intimate relationships, um, and they can do a lot of damage there. Generalize this further in the uh, cream color uh, circle here, the influences um, of work groups and social groups. Groups have a culture. My husband worked at um, General Motors, and they have a mean, nasty, snark snarky, and, and they actually were like mean, practical jokers. Uh, and then you come home. You know, uh, you know, and how do you shift gears from that? If that's the way you've been, you know, your work, most of us, we're, our coworkers see us more than our family ever will. Um, so people that come out of that culture, if they are not mindful of that, it's very easy to carry all of that home. And I hear, um, you know, so many couples where the person at home says, you know, you're, you're, you're not the foreman here, you know, or you're not the commanding officer here. Um, because people bring back that culture with them, whatever it is. Same with our social group. You know, there's a, some, some social groups have like kind of a, the frat boy culture. You know? Does that fit in raising your children? Probably not. So it takes a whole reprocessing, but again, you can see how this negative uh, element in one person, in one little brain, because one um, unknowing parent planted this seed with a silly, sarcastic remark that they said a couple of times. How it, you know, multiply that by all of us. It goes all the way into the culture. It goes into how we raise our family. Um, and now with uh, raising our family, we also have Facebook, text messaging, TV, schools, sports, all of these places. Um, a, a lot of them where being sarcastic is part of that culture, feeding that to our kids. Feeding that to them as we take away their opportunities for face-to-face -face communication. Um, so now we're being more and more sarcastic. We have more and more negative forces, and we have fewer ways to get feedback that's visual. Um, so that is how it permeates our culture. And that is how we get a whole herd of Karens. And we will always know what those are, <laughs> sadly for anybody who's named Karen. Um, if they've stolen your name, Karen. Sorry to say it. Um, if, if in written communication, um, the person 
is supposed to pick up on sarcasm. Don't bet on that. Studies have showed, the Scientific American had some, had, you know, they compiled studies, and they showed that the recipients of sarcasm via written word only picked up on it 56% of the time. So that means like 44% of the time, they're going to miss it. They're going to think you mean it. This opposite thing isn't going to work. Um, so uh, you know, I thought that was pretty uh, important and maybe something to help people be motivated because a lot of people, you know, I'm one of them, I, you know, like I've, I've confessed to this. That's the thing I like best about myself, you know. And I've always said, I, I, I'm, I'm not physically strong, I can't kill you, but I can make you wish you were dead. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, so I, well, do I want to give all that up? Well, you know, after 50 years of doing therapy, I kind of know where I can place that. Um, uh, but 44% of the time, the writing isn't getting across. And, and how much of your communication do you do, even with your intimates, that is on a text message? So all of us being more mindful can, be, can really make sense. Uh, otherwise, you're left with an, either a, an offended person who has no immediate recourse. And what does that mean? That they're trapped. That they get to build a resentment. That they get to be confused about the, a cryptic message. That they have a lot of anxiety built up around that thing they could not understand. Um, and it filters right back into your relationship with them. If that's your boss, um, if that's your daughter or son, do you really want that to happen? So really important in learning like where we can place sarcasm and we don't have to sacrifice it. Or if we do, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> um, the product uh, of all of this is lost or diminished relationships. If you sting somebody long enough, they're gonna walk away. And a lot of people miss people that treated them badly. Um, and they don't really get why, you know, and it's because there was some, there was some positive feeling uh, from that person, but there was something that constantly accompanied it that was this insidious underpinning of uh, not being good enough or not being liked. It also lowers your expectation of relationships. If you come from that, uh, you know, from a work culture where uh, people are kind of rough and tumble with their verbiage, um, and you get in a relationship with somebody, um, you might not expect any better from them. So if they don't give you a lot of direct, authentic, intimate communication, you don't miss it because this is how people talk to each other. So people don't even know what they're missing. I wish I could you know, sell this in little cards, like, when was the last time you had this? That somebody said, I really appreciate what you did for me, you know, that, that lives in your house. <laughs> We don't do that nearly often enough. Um, so I think we do have a lowered expectation of relationships. So what happens is our, our, again, permeating culture, our intimate relationships, our friend relationships, you know, they, uh, they all give us ways to part and they don't really give us ways to connect. So, so why keep it? Why not just yell at people and like, don't talk to me like that? Well, because we know that it does have some benefits. Um, and I'm kind of with Oscar Wilde. I think that, you know, that uh, the, the capability to speak in metaphor or to, uh, um, you know, to make ironic statements, to call back something funny from yesterday and implant it into something we say today in a different way. I think those are wonderful things that I hope people never give up. Um, and we know that the use of sarcasm promotes creativity um, for both the giving person and the receiving person. Well, why wouldn't it? Immediately you have to de you know, like decrypt something if it's a sarcastic comment. And so now you're at a higher state of arousal and you might want to go back and forth, but that puts people in a, in a really cool uh, part of their right side of their brain. Um, so how do we master this? I made some little, uh, I, I made some, these are off the top of my head, little rules and regs uh, about sarcasm. So if, if you notice that I have slides and at the end of my slides, it, I don't have a whole lot of references. Um, but it's because um, there was a point at which I thought this is common sense. However, I know that there is no common sense anymore and they should call it rare sense. Despite that, uh, I'm giving this to you as though I think everybody should know it, so pardon me for that. The number one thing I put was be aware of the relationship you're in when you're talking to somebody. Um, I had a, uh, a, um, an adult learner, you know, a non-trad student, um, who uh, 
called me for some information and I gave it to her and she didn't like what she heard and I said, well, nevertheless, this is as good as it's going to get. And um, when the next time she saw me, she said, you were so rude to me. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you to give another thought to calling somebody rude that's going to issue you a grade. Um, she, her agenda was to top dog. She wasn't looking at a whole big picture that she was in um, and how this could come back on her badly. And I think that's exactly what we do in intimate relationships. You know, you feel how you feel in the moment. You're going to say what you mean in the moment and, um, you know, worry about the rest later. No, worry about it ahead of time. Um, so the relationships you're targeting, first off, do they get it? Is this a person, you know, um, here at Beacon College, we work with people uh, who are on the uh, autism spectrum. Uh, many of them don't get the subtleties of humor. It's not only lost on them, it's hurtful because they, they, didn't, they had no way to decrypt um, the message. So uh, people that, are, uh, that have a lot of anxiety, that if somebody has a lot of anxiety, they're putting a lot of energy to uh, interpreting what's going on in the world. Um, they really don't stop to pick up subtleties a lot of times, and especially if they're very anxious. So you wouldn't make, um, like in a therapy session, I would, uh, in a lot of kinds of therapy, I would use a lot of humor, certainly sarcasm, um, and um, uh, some confrontation. When somebody's anxious, I don't do that because they're just barely processing what the basics as they come in. So. Uh, certainly assessing whether that person can understand it. A person has dementia. You don't really need to, you know, you just, you just want to do the basics. Parent-child relationships. These go two ways. A parent who's constantly sarcastic with their child, A, keeps somebody like me in business, <laughs> okay? And B, um, it really takes a risk with the child's self-esteem because kids really don't know how to, uh, how to interpret um, irony or it, it, for a while. Like they don't have abstract reasoning. If you tell them a nickel is better than the dime, they think a bit nickel is better than a dime because the nickel is larger. You know? So for them to get that you don't mean what you're saying to them, it's, it's not going to happen. They're just not that done yet. Um, so especially when kids are little, um, they, you know, giving them very clear uh, um, messages and then being careful of what you say around them. My bigger concern is how parents allow their children to speak to them. You know, and whenever I see it, uh, you know, a kid being sarcastic or, you know, to a parent, I think, oh my God, you're sending this kid out into the world and nobody's going to like him and he's not even going to know why. You know, uh, we want them to know why. Um, so how you speak to your partner and other people, not necessarily even just how you speak to your kids, if that's something that they pick up, help teach them, you know, help them to know what's appropriate and what's not. You know, um, the risk with uh, their um, demeanor towards parents, towards employers, um, even towards their peers, I think are really great and, and um, and the chance of them developing wonderful empathy is not so great, if that's the basis. Our language is how we construct our reality. So if our narrative is this constant uh, oppositional thing that has a life of its own, our reality is going to be oppositional. It's going to be hard to punch our way through life. Within intimate partners, I think um, one thing I wanted to say is it undermines trust. If I don't know if I can't count on if I'm telling you something important, if I can't count on the next thing you saying to me not being mean or sarcastic, um, what's the future of our relationship? If I can't trust what comes out of your mouth, then can I trust you know, where you spend the money and what you do with your time and you know, any of those things? So um, just... Uh, it's just kind of like an important piece of it as, as far as trust goes, but also a lot of times the sarcasm masks other issues. The people that you see, there are couples that, are, I call them the evil devil killer couples from hell. That sometimes, you know, you're in a position where you, know, you and your partner are going out with another couple and they're just so awful to each other and they're good at it. They're funny, they're laughing, we're laughing. 
I know my husband and I, when we leave, we both are simultaneously saying, I'm glad we're us. <laughs> you know, it's uncomfortable to be around them. I wonder how many times that is just masking other more um, important issues, that they keep that little energy going because if they stopped and they were honest, the conversation might be, I'm really not feeling us anymore. I wouldn't be with you if it weren't for the kids, you know. So this is a like a comfortable for them layer to be in, but really toxic for everybody else around. With peers, it, you know what? If if it's not reciprocal, it's going to be hurtful. Even your BFF, uh, if they aren't going back and forth with you, and you you know, and they get like kind of a a, a beat of a look um, before they go on with the conversation, you may have overstepped. It's probably worthwhile to check it out towards strangers, you know, this just risks your safety and security. I remember when we first start, started talking about road rage and people say, you know, like, don't get in fights with people on the road because they'll probably follow you home and hit you with a bat. Um, why did they say that? Because it happened, you know. I guess these were the pre-Karen Karens. <laughs> uh, it does risk your safety and security. It invites everybody who's aggressive to you. It um, sends away anybody that could be supportive or helpful. Uh, from you. So if you're out, you know, out in public and yet, you, you know, somebody that knows nothing about you um, will say something like, you must be a horrible father because who would do that? I'm walking by. I don't know anything. I just got a, a vision of something that happened decades ago. I was in a, in a store, like a big box store, with my little cart going around. Um, and uh, a woman was in another aisle. You know, and I didn't know what, she was just over there doing her shopping, I thought. Um, and she, she got it, somebody's cart was left in her way. And she just came out like, you should have never left your cart here. And she was like, what is wrong with you? Don't you have any manners? Um, and I just let her go through the whole thing. And I said, my cart's right here. You know, and I just kept going. Um, what, what inspires that in somebody? Well, you know, our culture does. Our, our, we think it's funny when Karen goes off. You know, um, so we encourage it, just like we encourage a lot of other things. We reinforce the behaviors we do not want. If you're going to, if you're moving along, if you're in a career, if you're moving along in a career, I guess I really want to address uh, how being, uh, how, how sarcasm, particularly what you risk if you're sarcastic towards your subordinates, if that is not your relationship. Now, some people, they've worked together for years, they can, they can go back and forth. But, for, but if you're the manager, don't think because you're good at it and you're funny that that doesn't get people to harbor resentment. And, you know, just, it's just like any kind of workplace um, uh, discrimination, uh, prejudice. All of those things have impact on everybody that witnesses them. So if, this, if you're snacking on somebody with your sarcasm, that person will become resentful. You probably will have a loss of productivity with the other people that, um, that are in that setting. Um, and then you risk that they sabotage you, that they only work well when you're right there. So um, that's what we have to, uh, about like kind of the relationship. So pay attention to what relationship am I in and what am I really want to say. Um, Stephen Wright said, light travels faster than sound. This is why some people appear bright until they speak. That resonated with me. <laughs> for some reason, I don't know. Um, so the second thing is to take ownership of your intent. You know, if I'm always making you the brunt of a joke, what's wrong with me? What's going on? So explore your own, like your global emotional needs. Are, are you somebody that likes a lot of approval? Are you trying to get, like garner the uh, attention from this? Do you want respect? And do you think this is a way to keep people in their place that they know that you could say something, you know, that you could, uh, give them a tweet storm. Um, so they, you know, and, and a lot of people um, confuse deferring to you with respecting you. Um, and it's the same with power. Do you do this for power and control? Um, a lot of people confuse brutality with power. Power is the thing that gets the job done. You know, it's speed and strength in sports. It's not anything about, uh, you know, there's no other statement there. Um, so it's the thing that gets the job done. Um, and people will, uh, the other need you might have is just to distance others. That, you know, you're not real comfortable in a situation, but you know you're good with your mouth. 
So you say things that keep people kind of on edge, which humor does. If, so if people don't know what's going to come out of your mouth next, you have them on a little bit of an uh, underdog position. So thinking about who you are and what your needs are. And then explore what motivates your sarcasm with any specific person. So you have global needs, we all do. Um, is there somebody that you really just don't like? I got busted on this. I was walking, I was talking to somebody, I thought cordially, you know, and um, I went into my colleague's office and my colleague said to me, I don't really like them, do you? And I said, how do you know that? Well, I, I was just listening to your conversation. I was running like, what, what was it? But I don't know what it was, but this person clearly picked up on some subtleties. Um, and it was true. It wasn't somebody uh, that, I, that I would ever want to have in my life. But I'm good at cordial, or I thought I was good at cordial. Guess not. Um, unfinished business. Do you have unfinished business? And so you're not going to let anything move further in your relationship because something's like you've got a, um, a burr in your saddle. Uh, but you're not ready to take it on or you don't know how to take it on. You don't know if you're ever going to take it on. So being a little snipey, you keep that person at distance if you have unfinished business with them. I think this is uh, pertinent to the holidays. You know, that you go home and you don't want to have that deep conversation with your sister about how you you know, the evil thing that she did. So you just kind of snipe little things at her and keep the conversation from, from, uh, uh, from going there. Um, if sarcasm increases inside of a relationship, I'm looking at it as, the, is this the beginning of the end? Whether that relationship is at work, people all of a sudden they're speaking their mind, or maybe they're speaking their goodbye. I'm <laughs> not just speaking their mind. And then envy. You know, if you think somebody's got it better than you, uh, and you're, you know, you're envious of what they have, um, you might want to take them down a peg. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, I was reading a uh, character in a book just that I was reading last week said to his brother, just because you had it bad does not mean that everybody else had it good. And I thought, I just want to put that on a street light or <laughs> on a billboard someplace, uh, because we do tend to put ourselves in the middle of it and think that we're all the only one. Um, so these are all little, again, seeds and underpinnings that if you explore them, you will choose your words better. Learning the specific skills. I think this is what everybody wants to know, like, oh, how do you do that? Um, my students would uh, say, oh, you're so quick. Well, yeah, I've been doing therapy for 50 years. So I kind of know what to say next. I'm, I'm not quick, I'm well rehearsed. Um, and just keep doing it. Um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell in Blink says you need to do something 10,000 hours before, before you be, do it intuitively. That's, you know, five full-time years. Um, so that's part of uh, learning the skills is just being mindful and then practicing them. But if you really want to have, uh, if you really want to crank up your, uh, your witty scale in the eyes of others. Um, work on a smooth delivery. You want to say what you're going to say in the fewest words possible. Keep an even tone, not a whole lot of inflection, medium volume. And then uh, I, I call it the two, beat, uh, the two beat method, that you wait two beats, say what you're going to say, and then don't say anything else for two beats. Maybe don't say anything else at all and just let it hang there. So um, a, a, an irony, uh, a little something that you put out in a way that's, uh, that has to be decrypted, leave it there, let it hang there. You don't have to explain yourself. It's like explaining a joke, it really loses something. A, a cute verbal trick, I say it's cute because it's so fun to do, and, and watch what, watch your, you know, in your sitcoms, anybody that you like because they have that, you know, like their house or, you know, some other snipey little character. Listen to the things that they do verbally. And one of the best uh, and easiest little tricks to learn about this is to pick up right where the other person leaves off. Use as much of their verbiage as you possibly can. Um, I have a friend who um, came out to a class she was in. It was a small master level class and she, it was pertinent to what they were talking about. And uh, when she was done, uh, a, a man in the class said to her, do, do you think if you, if you found the right man that you would change your mind? And she said to him, do you think if you found the right man you would change your mind? Okay, so that was the perfect um, echo uh, of, of what had been said and picking up where they left off. They're already in that mode, they're already in that rhythm. You say that right back to them and let it dangle. Um, and it was sarcastic, you know. <laughs> it was, I thought it was priceless. Um, 
you know, uh, the example uh, that I think of all the time is so I see that you gained weight, and then you could, you could say, and I hear that you lost your manners. You know, you stop people in their tracks, confront them, but use as many of their words as you can. So, you know, pay attention to what you hear from people that you consider to be funny, and you'll see all the little formulas that they use. Um, use yourself for practice. You know, this, like self-deprecating humor, first off, it, it's appealing. And somebody can laugh at themselves, you know, and say, okay, yeah, like I'm, I'm a dunce, you know, <laughs> which I say a lot. Uh-oh, I'm a dunce. Um, but w that self-deprecating de humor, it really changes how you think about things. Um, it, you know, if somebody, and this would be one that would be very typical to me, like somebody say, oh, you should have had children. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm so warm and fuzzy, you know, because I'm not. But you know that's the irony. I'm saying the opposite of what is, um, and it's on me. I'm not saying it toward you. I'm saying it towards me, you know? and I'm acknowledging my, the, my lack of warmth and fuzziness most of the time. Um, it invites people in. It invites people in to who you are. If you have that self-deprecating humor, it makes them more gentle toward you a lot of times. Most of them aren't going to get on the bus and keep pointing their finger at you if you've already done it. It took the wind out of any negative sales, and it might have put something, a positive perspective on you for some others. Um, so as I sifted through all of the, you know, uh, sarcastic kind of quips that they have. And of course, you know, I didn't get to the end of the internet, but nearly. I found this one and I thought it just struck me funny. And I know that it would be hurtful. <laughs> I know there's no place to actually say it, but I had to bring it. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings when I called you stupid. I really thought you already knew. Um, I can think of people I'd like to say that to, and I don't care about the relationship. I admit it. You should too. Okay, so your response to sarcasm. Um, again, your response should be a smooth delivery. You know, you want to also um, keep things as uh, even as possible. If you're if, a simple way to say to um, to put the, to bring the put the brakes on, is to say, "I disagree," and then say no more. Let that hang in the air, without explaining yourself. Um, be direct. Ask for what you want, and then wait. Let that let silence do your work. So if somebody, so uh, you know, I think if somebody says something really snippy and sarcastic, are you being sarcastic for the moment, or trying to permanently ruin our relationship? And then wait for their answer. They they've got it. They've got to go in and get that answer. Could you say that in a way that wouldn't piss me off? I've said that. Um, so, and, and actually leaning into, it's like kind of paradoxical, like leaning into uh, and not putting resistance to the content of what they said. Somebody who was close to one time said to me, are you eating again? You're going to get so fat. And I did my little two second thing and I said, well, that'd be up to me, wouldn't it? So the next day, candy arrived. I got candy. Somebody recognized that they crossed the boundary. It was never spoken of again. Uh, it was taken care of. There are certain things that, um, you know, the boundaries that you have, you have the right to do that. You don't have to be mean back. You know, it's it's uh, not necessary. So I guess I wanted to say in a summary, make words a study. Words are so cool. And again, our, you know, how, how, how we put it in words is how we live it. So the more you can change the verbiage of anything in your life to make it reflect what you want it to be, the more you'll have that. Um, embrace sarcasm, it's part of that. Um, there's a, there is a good book for staving off the sarcastic people, it's, and it's called Nasty People, How to Stop Being Hurt by Them Without Stooping to Their Level, and it's by a person called Jay Carter. Um, and finally, uh, laugh at yourself every chance you get. We really, are, we really are comical as a species. Of course, this is my final slide, so it's back to you, Daryl. Dr. Nance, thank you for that insightful and thoughtful presentation. Would you like to follow up with questions or your own observations for Dr. Nikki Nance? Feel free to send your questions or comments to beaconsalon at beaconcollege.edu. That concludes this installment of the Beacon Salon Lecture Series. When we meet again in March, Dr. Christopher Huff will give a provocative lecture on embracing hate and ignoring history. 
the sordid tale of Holocaust denial. Visit the Beacon College website at beaconcollege.edu backslash salon for the latest up-to-date listing on when the program will premiere. Until then, I'm Daryl Owens. Thank you for joining us.